Hey, what's good, self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great, and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital, and today it's time for our Wednesday midweek cannabis update. So before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learned something, all I ask is that you leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And then, of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, make sure you subscribe. There's plenty of content you can catch up on, uh, but that way you don't miss any future episodes coming out. Because we were gifted with this juicy headline on Sunday that cannabis is going global at a rapid pace. Uh, after what I covered in last week in cannabis, that Cureleaf purchased EMAC Life Sciences in the UK, and British American Tobacco purchased a 20% equity stake in Organogram in Canada, while the Mexico legalization push is seen appealing to multinational firms. Now, I think this is quite misleading because cannabis is not going global at all. We need political and economic, we need political uh, factors to change first in a lot of these you know, regions outside of North America. However, a more accurate title would be together the developments show that global receptiveness to cannabis is accelerating, which we want. That is, that is kind of what we're hoping for. Um, because when you think about it, Cureleaf's not investing in EMAC for profits right away. They're not investing for return on investment. BAT is not investing in Organogram for return on investment. That's more of, you know, potentially to be able to just take over Organogram in the future, uh, you know, invest in their R&D and, you know, work with them to, to learn about the cannabis industry. Um, and then with Mexico too, it seems like a lot of these big uh, multinational companies already in Mexico, uh, whether it be pharmaceutical, alcohol, and consumer products, um, they see it as an attractive way to get high quality manufacturing in, in Mexico for low cost. And this comes from Emily Paxia, managing partner of Poseidon Asset Management, which has been investing in cannabis for a while. So, you know, it quickly went from focusing on domestic opportunities of actually growing and cultivating to how can you just participate in the global supply chain? Because without a doubt, this industry is growing. It's going to be massive. How can people get a piece of it, even if they don't, you know, you don't have to grow cannabis or anything like that. What supply chain part can you get into? So that was that's an interesting take I hadn't considered before. Um, and apparently EMAC is in eight countries now, but the laws in the European Union make it likely that national borders won't slow things down the way state borders have within the U.S. Um, and Jordan doesn't plan to stop with Europe. But again, the main thing is laws in the European Union have to first change before can really accelerate or see any growth on the ground there. Mind you, countries like Poland, Ukraine, South Africa, there are even rumors of Egypt moving towards legalization. This would be great, and Europe would be a hub. So, you know, the future is very bright. I love this quote that the U.S. market will be very healthy, but I believe Europe will grow faster than the U.S. in the 2023 to 2025 time frame. Now, um, Boris Jordan obviously has some sort of, you know, insights into why that might be, but that's why I'm focusing, at least in, in trying to tell viewers, that focus on the U.S. market for 2021 and 2021 and 2022, then 2023, 2024 is where Europe and Mexico might actually open up and, and start to see more growth. But just to point out, yeah, we saw a lot of deals previously, 2018, 2019. And did these make for good return on investments for any of the companies that invested in these cannabis companies? No, not really. Constellation Brands invested $5 billion in Canopy, and Canopy spent about $4 billion of it. It's, yeah, not great. So, you know, partnerships and deals don't necessarily make money. That's why I focus so much on the fundamentals, what's actually happening on the ground. And just as an example, Can Trust is the one Canadian LP you could not trust. And they got their licenses taken away from Health Canada because they grew cannabis in rooms that were not licenses. So it just goes to show a lot of growing pains and trial and error. But had Canada not gone through that first, you know, um, the U.S. wouldn't have had it so easy. So also just want to point out that from Bloomberg, we're seeing their Cannabis Weekly. They're copying my This Week in Cannabis segment. But we're also seeing from The Hill more awareness in cannabis and just distributing facts to people, which is important. That's what the news was originally for. But pandemic sparks cannabis sales boom. Um, and what we can see is that the pandemic did for the industry more than anything else is allow new customers to have experiences that they didn't previously. So Jackson said the perfect storm or the perfect storm of people having more time and wanting to have more experiences and consuming, whether it was for mental health issues, uh, mental issues, health issues, etc. It doesn't matter what the issue is. The perfect storm allowed for that positive trend to continue across the states and across cities and realize people get their freedom of choice back. It's an empowering thing. And if you have an access, if you have access to a legal market, chances are you're going to buy from that legal market as opposed to the black market. It's just how humans work and Canada's proved that. So in states where recreational cannabis is legal, sales have boomed during the pandemic while other brick and mortar businesses suffered. <laughs> That's true. Like, absolutely true. Resilient industry, recession proof almost. And Americans spent 71% more last year than on cannabis products than they did in 2019. Because if I'm stressed, I'm turning to cannabis. It's the best stress reliever I've ever come across. So just wanted to point that out. I know I've covered this a lot, but good to see it from The Hill and other large publications. Uh, now we see Forbes. Democrat senators elevate federal cannabis reform to high priority. And again, this is just, this is unprecedented news. And I'm, I've been covering a lot of the same stuff, so I'm not going to dive too deep into this. All of these links will be in the description, but 
Schumer also appears to be addressing other obstacles such as the taxation and banking. And you know, while the MORE Act does not create a commercial cannabis industry, uh, it affects everything else. The social, criminal, and racial justice reforms or covers everything else, what I meant to say. But and so, so ultimately, it will deschedule cannabis. And what we have, though, is again the most powerful politicians in Congress saying that they intend to reform these laws, saying that they will, and we have until the end of 2021, so this is great, and it just reiterates that the States Act, um, if the MORE Act is passed and deschedules cannabis and decriminalizes it, then the States Act is the bill that says, hey states, you can do whatever you want with cannabis, and you have no fear of the federal government coming over and over, or st stepping in and overruling, and that is the main uh, difference between the states and the MORE Act, but then we also have the Safe Banking Act, which would kind of pave way for this commercial cannabis industry, smooth out those cranks, and then allow for the decriminalization and States Act to come in. And, and that is why it seems to be why they want to do safe banking first. Obviously, there's money to be made, and obviously, if you're invested, you're going to benefit more from it than if you're not. But, you know, that's where we are today. And um, more from Congress, just feds should legalize cannabis and expunge drug records, congressional resolution urges. We know this. Um, and um, this representative, Ayanna Presley, has, has quite a lot to say, and she's packing a lot into this one paragraph saying, we need to do all this, 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 and I agree, yes. <laughs> Decriminalizing cannabis uh, and descheduling will lead to all of this. But first and foremost, let's just you know get safe, get safe passed, get these bills passed. But I also just want to point out that this would not be possible. We would not have congressional leaders and lawmakers writing letters to, to the federal government or, or whoever the powers that be if it wasn't for the Democratic majority that won with the Georgia Senate runoff vote in January. So that just goes to emphasize how important that change was. Uh, and this is from New York. Gosh, they're taking a long time. Legislator nears deal on recreational cannabis. Can't you just put out an article when it's done? Stop saying, You're, New York's closer to a deal. New York gets close to a deal. New York's almost at a deal. Just wait till you have a deal and then do it. But nonetheless, the American people want this. Cuomo knows this. They've got until April 1st. I think it will come sooner. And we've got Village Farms International reporting their fourth quarter and year-end 2020 financial results. Uh, and VFF's one of my sleeper Canadian LP picks, showing a gener uh, generating an EPS earnings per share of $0.12 cents for Q4 and then 20 for the year of 2020. Now, the main thing, though, is that uh, Village Farms Consolidated includes their uh, revenue from vegetable distribution and Pure Sun Farms, which is their cannabis subsidiary. But some of the main things to consider was they had the top selling brand of Dread Flower products on the OCS for both the quarter and year end of December 2021 and remain the top selling brand of Dread Flower um, since the launch of October 2019. So the main thing when I look for in a company is that you're growing your revenue and, you know, in that case, also profits, profits while cutting costs. Uh, quarter over quarter. Uh, you have to see growth quarter over quarter. Otherwise, they're not growing uh, and you know organically. And so the continued rollout helps them get vapes, uh, which means they're uh, taking up more market segments and categories, which is good. Uh, but you know some of the stuff down here, their supply agreement with medical with Shoppers Drug Mart, that's something a free in. A lot of these companies did in 2018 too. It really didn't seem to amount to much. So this is more fluff to be like, hey, this is what we've partnered with. Uh, they do have a credit agreement with the Bank of Montreal not dealing with the same pains that they had to a long time ago in 2018. But if we look at their Pure Sun Farms, the main thing I think is worth pointing out is that, you know, from last quarter, or from last quarter, up 13.6 million to 29.5 million. And it was in 2020, I believe, that Pure Sun Farms, or that Village Farms International became 100% owners of Pure Sun Farms. Previously, they only owned 50%. So it's nice to see that such an increase because they now own 100%. Of the company, mind you, some of their other things, net income EBITDA, did shrink from from last year. So whether this is due to expansion and whatnot, um, fundamentally though, healthy. I think it's good to see the total gross sales increasing because if your gross sales are increasing, it means you're increasing your market share. Now I do not own VFF, but long term, um, I think they will do do very well. Mainly because I wanted to point out this COVID nineteen update. Um, the all Village Farms production facilities in Texas, British Columbia, and Pearson Farms facility in Canada remain open and operational. So facilities in Texas are good, which, which is very important. I know that, that weather, that cold freeze that came through was a, a big question for them. But as you can see, they've got a dominant position in retail flour, which they have been growing. Um, and, you know, as a low cost producer, they'll be able to have a good advantage in the wholesale game too. So good job, VFF, and these earnings. Nice to see that from an LP, seeing growth quarter over quarter um, and profitability. Now, I've covered Columbia Cares previously because they'd posted these earnings, I think the unaudited versions. But again, the comparative, you know, comparing to an LP, 51% quarter over quarter growth, 234%. That's where these MSOs have that power. Not only in states are the political and like socioeconomic factors changing, 
but they've got the populations to show for it. Um, and as you can see, they're, they're going with the same approach of Green Thumb and Cure Leaf, getting into as many states as possible. So Columbia Care is putting in a lot of work to expanding Arizona, California, Colorado, Florida, Illinois, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and providing this 2021 outlook. They plan to do 500 to 530 million in revenue, um, with you know 20 percent of that, 95 to 105 million in uh, just EBITDA profit. So if you can try, you know. If you can get into Columbia Care anytime their market cap dips below even $2 billion or something like that, reflecting a very low valuation compared to their total revenue, that is when you want to get in, and that uh, would be technically a steal. So good job, Columbia Care, as well. Now, while U.S. pot companies are going faster compared to Canadian rivals, their shares are harder to trade. So we hear from the Wall Street Journal. Some of these mainstream uh, presses covering, covering what I'm talking about, which is awesome. Hmm... Mind you, that they are listed on the OTC in the U.S., so it's strange that they don't mention that. Like, hey, you can invest in these in, in the U.S. There's just risk of investing that the federal government can come and get you since the coal memorandum's been redacted. Um, and then there's also just, you know, the fact that people don't invest on the OTC because they're technically, they're not as reputable companies. They're, they're looked at differently, but just want to point that out. Now, I also just don't think that's true. Um, Canadian companies aren't just going to come in and buy MSOs, not that many. The only one, the only deal in play, I think there's Fire and Flower, which is a retailer that has a plan to buy a potential uh, retailer in the U.S. And then there's Canopy, which plans to buy TerraSend uh, and Acreage, or a large portion of TerraSend and Acreage. But besides that, I, I don't think any other MSO is, is, is aiming to be bought by a Canadian company. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think so. And then, but any reform could leave them locked out of the attractive U.S. market for several more years. That again, I don't think we know. We don't know that, so I just, for them to say that, we don't, we just have to wait and see what happens. But. Safe. Safe. And well, when that happens and people realize the difference between the valuations and the fundamentals, Canadian stocks could quickly lose their stock market premium. So just be aware of that. If this, th that is a reality that could happen. So just, you know, we could see a decrease in total market cap valuation for all the Canadian LPs when you actually start to look at the underlying fundamentals. So. <laughs> US cannabis stocks look like a better long-term trip or a better trip long-term. This isn't magic mushrooms, man. Like, it's just cannabis. Oh, Wall Street Journal, you're funny. Um, but I did want to scroll down here because Sabatino, another person like Todd Harrison, an individual investor that I kind of, I, I do pay attention to, they are very vocal on being, hey, be careful what you're investing in. Know what you're investing in. Because yes, the top four MSOs are much better fundamentally than the top five LPs put together. Again, there are good LPs in there, but when you group them together, there's really no comparison. And if... Uh, MSOs could be listed on the NASDAQ and New York Stock Exchange and treated like other CPG uh, businesses trading at a 20x price to sales or price to revenue multiple. We could expect these prices for um, US MSOs, which is pretty great. Now again, why do Canadian companies rise when there's news about cannabis and the US ones don't? Because the US ones trade on the OTC, whereas the Canadian ones trade on the NASDAQ. And the reality is, folks, I wouldn't be all in on cannabis. Most people wouldn't be all in on cannabis if all of this didn't happen already. So remember, this is all behind us and the momentum is pushing us forward, which is amazing. Now, another graphic I wanted to show you. Now, I do not have the technical financial background as I did not study finance or anything like that. So I do not necessarily know the best way to present this. So I just want to share that with you all. But if you look at where all of the other industries are grouped based on uh, enterprise value divided by their EBITDA potential for 2022, they're all sitting in the same range. US MSOs are sitting at a 16x, similar to tech, retail brands, um, beverage, and CPG, right? But only, all of these industries down here only 
are expecting a maximum of 30% uh, 2021 and 2022% EBITDA growth into the next few years, which just means that their growth will not be maintained over time. And the outlier is the US MSOs with a 60% EBITDA growth. So what is EBITDA growth? Um, EBITDA growth means with respect to each performance period, the percentage growth in the company's consolidated earnings before uh, interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, which is EBITDA. Uh, so what is a good EBITDA growth rate? A good growth rate varies on the industry, but a 60% margin in most industries would be a good sign. And this is, again, margin for 2021, supposed to be 60%, and for 2022, 60%. And this will come with the Safe Banking Act removing that 280E tax uh, so that they can keep more profits. That is a big portion of this as well. But what this just tells me is that the U.S. MSOs are the outliers in any industry in the U.S. Correct me if I'm wrong. Please let me know. Um, but so to see this guy, I love these charts when they come out. Any any other industries, you can buy 60% EBITDA growth at 16x 2022 EBITDA. I still don't know what that means, so I'm going to try and do some more learning to figure out that what that is. Um, and the other thing to show is just compared to traditional industries, as we can see, uh, the MSOs are compared and, and relative to where they are. But uh, the, this reputable enterprise value to EBITDA multiple in different industries tends to go up over time, right? As they're as they're allowing for more growth to be in the price. So just wanted to show you that as well. Seems like uh, these MSOs are just an undervalued steal. Now, some news in the States. Arizona adult use cannabis sales hit 2.9 million during initial 10 days, um, which is pretty awesome. Recreational sales began January 22nd after 73 of 130 licenses were approved. And I imagine since then more have been approved, more stores have been open and filling, uh, supplying the demand and therefore probably being able to sell more than 2.9 going forward. Um, as 2.9 in 10 days doesn't seem like a lot, but Main thing is that the state of Arizona collected $226,000 in tax revenue off of these sales, and Arizona's market is projected to reach 375 to $400 million in its first full year. This is just their adult use market, not combined with medical, um, and then more than $700 million yearly by 2024. When you combine that with medical, let's see how long it takes Arizona to get to a billion. Now, if we look at some MSOs, Planet 13 announces a partnership with Cureleaf's Select Brand to open Select Shop in Shop. Um, in the Las Vegas Superstore. So basically what we're seeing is the first of MSOs joining together. Um, so Planet 13 will be selling a lot of cure. Well, not this is not the first at all. What am I talking about? We see this all the time, but again, it's just more execution on the ground. Planet 13 and Cureleaf coming together to, uh, to again, try to have a one-stop shop for everything in Vegas, which is pretty good. So again, it's just going to show that despite what the charts this week are seeing, you know, um, what was it? Yesterday, even Columbia Care puts out their earnings and the prices go down. Cureleaf puts out their earnings, their share price goes down. It doesn't matter because <laughs> look what they're just executing and doing. That's what you got to focus on when you're investing for the fundamentals. Green Thumb Industries opens Rise Paramus, uh, its second retail location in New Jersey. So, uh, you know, as New Jersey's bills have been signed and that market's going to take a long time to, to create, probably eight to 12 months before we see sales, um, at least for the adult use anyways. Uh, they Green Thumb is increasing their footprint there already, which is good to see. And Grow Generation, again, not an MSO, but more of a supplier of uh, growing materials for cannabis growers, acquires Orange County's 55 hydroponics, establishing a foothold in Southern, Cal uh, Southern California, bringing their locations to 51 nationwide. So they're growing at a very fast pace, not slowing down. So again, great for MSOs, but also great for other companies in the industry um, where the pros go to grow. Awesome tagline for them. So that's just great to see that this industry is growing regardless of what the ch stock charts are reflecting. Now, a few studies just to point out here, the relationship between cannabis use and emerge, uh, exercise among young adults in middle age. This was very confusing to read through, but the highlight of it, marijuana use may be associated with various forms of exercise and sport. <laughs> Um, and the primary data sets for these analysis, or no, what was it? Marijuana users are equal to or more likely to exercise than non-users. How wild is that? So, I mean, I exercise every single day, um, and I happen to use cannabis every evening to help me sleep. So not that, I don't know if they're correlated, but I certainly realize the value of exercise in my daily life. And I, I do not skip a day if I don't need to, because I know how good it makes me feel and how important it is for my body. So just want to point that out. Now, some of the writing here is very confusing. Results show that particularly for fixed effects models, marijuana use is not significantly related to exercise, counter to conventional wisdom that cannabis users are less likely to be active. Conventional wisdom, conventional propaganda. We don't really have much wisdom because we've never looked, we've never found answers or facts when we've looked at cannabis. 
because we look for risks as opposed to benefits. Mind you, indeed, the only significant estimates suggest a positive relationship, even among heavier users during the past 30 days. These findings are at odds with much of the existing literature, which generally shows a negative relationship between marijuana use and exercise. So as additional states legalize the medicinal and recreational use of cannabis, perhaps its impact on exercise, one of the most leading social determinants of health, is not necessarily a primary concern. I mean, I never believed it was. I don't know why people thought it would be, but that's interesting to at least show that Exercise and cannabis seem to go hand in hand, which is awesome. And then this one, cannabis compound inhibits SARS-CoV-2 replication in human lung cells. This is amazing, and this is why we need to deschedule de so we can study the plant. Researchers in the U.S. have conducted a study showing that the cannabis plant compound inhibited, which means did not allow, infection with severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 in human lung cells. Like, what? How is this not news? How is this not echoing on every media outlet? It is the agent responsible for the epidemic we've been or the pandemic we've been going through uh, that continues to sweep the globe and Marsha Rosner of the University of Chicago in Illinois and Coley found that the CBD um, found that CBD now again CBD is a compound but there's so much we don't know about it and it's metabolite 7 OH CBD so a, a, I don't know so a molecule within that compound or something like that potency blo potently blocked SARS COVID-2 replication in lung epithelial cells. So the CBD inhibited viral gene expression and reversed many of the effects the virus has on host gene transcription. The compound also induced the expression of interferons, cell signaling proteins that are produced by host cells as an early response to viral invasion. So furthermore, um, the the incidence of infection was up to an order of magnitude lower in a cohort of patients who had been taking CBD compared with matched patients who had not been taking CBD. So. Not to say it, but CBD apparently seems to help re repel the Rona situation from taking over your lungs. That is unbelievable. That, uh, again, early science, but uh, that, that's why we just need more research. Uh, and, and just to, to, to add this, the, the data on legalizing cannabis, we know that the data is positive. And despite what we saw last week, that, that governor of Nebraska literally saying that you'll kill your kids, which is the most insane thing ever. Um, no, yeah, there's no data that says that. He's, he's a complete liar. But what we can see from the decades of data from Colorado and Washington and from Canada, legalization doesn't seem to substantially affect crime rates. Overall, violent crime is neither sword nor plummeted. Doesn't change a thing. Legalization seems to have little or no effect on traffic incidents or fatalities. Uh, found evidence, this study that I had in my series, Reality Check Cannabis in 2020, suggesting it had no effect on trends in traffic fatalities in both Colorado or Washington. Legalization has barely affected the price. In fact, in Canada, we've reduced the price. And price only gets reduced when you open up enough legal outlets so that people that go to the black market would rather buy from legal outlets because they get to know what they're buying and they get to, well, and then eventually the price goes down as more outlets open up, right? You see how that works. So that's just the side effect of, of expanding and giving enough outlets to actually you know, supply the demand, much like alcohol stores or much like every single corner store has cigarettes to sell. It just, it just, just makes sense. And then legalization has created jobs, lots of jobs. Yes, that is a fact of 321,000 jobs as of last year. Legalization is good for state's budget, state budgets. Colorado usually collects more than 20 million a month in tax revenue and legalization may be good for states workers comp programs. Uh, and this is quite new, but it finds that states uh, that legalized recreational cannabis saw a significant decline in the use of their workers' compensation systems. So yeah, people feel people play less of the victim role, and they're like, well, I, I guess I don't need to get workers' comp because I can go, just go get a job now. <laughs> and um, in, in a sense, I, I don't know about, about you, but with cannabis in my experiences, it's almost helped me hear my conscience more clearly and be able to just make better decisions and make changes about myself that I felt needed to be made. And again, not in the time when I'm necessarily consuming, but I can at least see that. And then in the future, I try to, you know, just improve, maybe do less of that habit I don't want to do and replace it with a new one. It's just so much to learn about this plant. So anyways, that is it for this midweek update, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave a like on the channel. If you learned something and subscribe so that you don't miss any new videos, let me know in the comments or the descriptions which MSO earnings you are most looking forward to. And I will be back on Sunday for this week in cannabis. Have a great day, everybody.